Good morning, everybody. Um, get things started with the official gaveling in of the second meeting, meeting of the commission on um, paid family medical leave. Um, I'm sorry, commission to develop a paid family medical leave benefits program. Good morning, I am Senator Maddie Daughtry and I am honored to be the Senate chair of this wonderful commission. We're gonna get this uh, started with introductions and then we'll jump right in. So I will kick it off to my house chair, Representative here to introduce herself. Good morning, everyone. I am Kristen Cloutier, and I represent House District 60, which is part of my hometown of Lewiston. Can I have Representative Stearns introduce himself? I'm going around in squares that I can see, which might not be the same order for everybody. Hollywood Squares this morning. Yes. Good morning. My name is Paul Stearns. I represent House District 119. I live in Guilford in Piscataquis County. And Senator Rosen. Thank you, Madam Chairs. I'm Senator Kimberly Rosen. My district goes from Castine through the city of Brewer all the way up to Lincoln, and I live in beautiful Bucksport. Thank you. Uh, Emily? I'm Emily Ingerson. Um, I live in Arundel, and I own a small business, Ginger Hill Design and Build. I'm a small business representative. Commissioner Fortman? Hi, I'm Laura Fortman. I'm the commissioner of the Department of Labor and here to provide whatever technical assistance I can to the committee. Thank you. Sarah? Good morning, my name is Sarah Bryden. Um, I am here in the role of bringing my professional expertise in the area of leave of absence compliance. Thank you. Uh, Wendy? Good morning, I'm Wendy Estbrook. I'm the director of HR Shared Services for LL Bean, so representing larger employers. Drew Christopher. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Drew Christopher Joy. I work at the Southern Maine Worker Center and I'm here um, representing employees and independent contractors. Thank you, Barbara. Hi, I'm Barbara Crowley. I'm a retired pediatrician healthcare administrator um, at Maine General and I'm here to represent the interests of children and mothers. Thank you. And we are ably assisted today and every day by our fabulous OPLA analysts, Anna Broom and Colleen McCarthy-Reed. Just some quick um, housekeeping updates to remind everyone that we are streaming live. Um, we, our video is available through YouTube and our audio is also being streamed through the legislative website. Um, if you have any questions, please let us know. Um, and with that, we have um, a bunch of exciting presentations today. Um, first up, we're going to be uh, having a couple of presentations on sort of a national perspective on paid family and medical leave programs to sort of really help us sort of set the foundation um, as we're moving forward to be aware of what's out there, what's been done. Um, and I'm really excited to have joining us. Um, first off, we have Marianne Belsorte from Family Values at Work and also Molly Weston Williamson. I'm going to just give quick introductions to both of them and then we'll pass it right over to them. Um, Marianne um, has her entire life, according to her bi biography, been inspired by the great stories of many great women in her life. And their stories made her want to show that women could do anything, that they're strong, brave, smart, and amazing. Their answer to what do you want to be when you grow up might have changed a few times. She always knew who she wanted to be, someone who stood up for themselves and for others. And through her work at Family Values, she's had a chance to take that stand and a chance to help others find their voice as well. Marianne has spent 15 years in different roles um, with Family Values at work as a supporter, a state lead, and now as their national implementation director. During that time, she's advocated for paid sick and safe, uh, safe days, fair work week, pay equity, paid leave, and rights for domestic workers. And she continues to leverage policy opportunities to build long-term power for communities so that they can lead and win future issues at the intersection of race, class, and gender. And Molly Weston Williamson with A Better Balance is the Director of Paid Leave and Future Work and Senior Staff Attorney at A Better Balance, where she leads A Better Balance's advocacy around paid leave laws across the country and directs ABB's efforts to address the needs of all workers in a changing workforce. She initially joined A Better Balance as a Lyman Fellow and prior to this, she clerked for the Honorable Thomas Ambro of the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. 
Her academic work has appeared in the Yale Law Journal, the Connecticut Journal of Public Interest Law, and the NYU Journal of Legislation and Public Policy. And she serves on the board of directors of the Connecticut Paid Family Medical Leave Insurance Authority. And she graduated Phi Beta Kappa with high honors from Swarthmore College and received, received her JD from the Yale Law School. Um, and I'm excited to have them both joining us today. And I apologize, I hope I didn't massacre either of your names. Um, before I pass it over, I do wanna say for the commission members and for those who are following along at home, um, for many of us who've been involved in these policies, we've all turned to these organizations to sort of look at their frameworks and also sort of their snapshots and their policy briefs on these. So we're really lucky to have um, you know, two individuals joining us who've really done a lot of national research on this and are a great asset for us to ask them lots of questions. Um, just for commission members, I think what we'll do is have them both present and if everyone can just jot down their questions and we'll jump into it after the presentations. Um, but if there's something really like a burning question, just let me know and we can go from there. But without further ado, I wanted to introduce um, Molly and Marianne. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having us. Um, and you did great with my name. So thank you. Um, I think I am going to go first and then Molly is going to take over from there. And I do have some slides. I'm hoping Colleen is able to present them. I um, my Definitely hold them up for you right now. Great, thank you. Yeah, my phone does not always like to play well with presentations. Yeah. So I think everybody, can everyone see those? You can see it. It might help right. if you're full screen. So that yep. way. That's what I'm gonna do right now. Uh, let's see. Is that better? Um, I think if you go up to view, so yeah, I'm going to go full. Hold on. Full screen mode. Perfect. How's that? Perfect. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, so thank you all so much for having me here today. I'm really excited to talk to you all about paid family and medical leave in the States and also the need for good implementation when there is a paid family and medical leave policy. Uh, my name is Marianne Bellasardi. I'm the National Implementation Director at Family Values at Work. I want to tell you a little bit about our organization. We grew out of the recognition that value and caregiving is key to achieving racial, gender, and economic equity. Uh, the people who started our network saw the need to really support grassroots groups that were working in the states and on local policies around paid family and medical leave and paid sick days so that they could develop the policies that were right for their area, but then also help pave the way for a national standard. Our goal was to build capacity and share resources, messaging, best practices, and lessons from the field. And together right now, our coalitions include over 2000 diverse partner organizations, including some in Maine. And we have helped over 55 million workers gain access to paid sick and safe days, as well as to paid family and medical leave. Um, and I, on the next slide, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what each of those terms mean. If you wanna go over to the next one, thank you. So um, I heard a little bit already as people were jumping on the call, some conversation about paid family and medical leave versus paid sick days and what the differences were. And I always think it's a good place to start with any of these conversations. Um, whether you're reading about them in the news or even talking to legislators sometimes, there is some confusion. And for those of us who talk about this every day, uh, we've come up with certain terms and ways that we talk about it. And uh, you all are gonna be talking about it quite a bit over the next few months. So I thought I would share those terms with you as well. The first thing that we talk about is paid sick days. Um, this is a short amount of time. It's usually measured in days uh, and it's there to help your family or to yourself um, with a short-term medical need. So if you have a routine doctor's visit, if you come down with the flu and you need a couple of days off, if those things happen to your family members, that's what paid sick days are for. Certainly if you have a more serious illness, you can absolutely use that time um, to take care of yourself or your family member as well. 
But since it's usually just measured in days, sometimes even hours, it, it's hard to take care of a serious long-term illness with just paid sick days. In Maine, uh, starting this year, there's a policy, you all are actually calling it paid time off because it's a little bit more extensive than just sick time. And workers and businesses of 10 or more are able to earn time in order to take care of themselves and their family members or to use as vacation time. Uh, they earn one hour of time for every 40 hours they work, up to 40 hours per year. Certainly employers can be more generous than that, but this sets a baseline for workers in the state to take the time that they need to care for themselves and their loved ones. The next thing that you might hear about actually a lot is paid parental leave. And this is the leave that parents take when they have a new child come into their life, whether that child is by birth or foster care or adoption. It's an amount of time, usually measured in weeks, to bond with that child um, and just to be there for them in these first new weeks together. So um, you may hear of this as maternity leave, paternity leave, parental leave. It's all generally the same. And it's usually only available within the first year that a child is with you. Um, so if you have a two-year-old child that you know, you've had for the past two years, but that child becomes sick and needs serious medical care. Parental leave usually does not extend to that time. And that's where we get to paid family and medical leave. And you'll see here the difference just in the picture of the number of people who are covered. So paid family and medical leave is for your entire family as well as for you. It is time, usually measured in weeks, to take care of a serious medical need. Um, it may include childbirth and bonding time. It may include cancer treatment and recovery. It may include, uh, you know, a car accident recovery or helping your parent who is dealing with a stroke, helping your sibling. Anyone who you consider family is usually covered under paid family and medical leave. And it is time to heal and to care. And um, if there is one thing that we have learned over the past 18 months, it is the importance of having that time in order to take care of yourself and the people that you love. Next slide, please. Now, you all, I'm sure as you go through this process, are going to hear from time to time about the unintended consequences of different policies. Um, I wanted to talk for a moment about the intended consequences of paid family and medical leave. And some of these you may know already, but I always think it's great just to mention it for a moment and make sure that everyone is thinking about it when they're thinking about these policies. So paid family and medical leave will help strengthen breastfeeding and bonding among new parents. It can help strengthen workforce attachment because it makes it easier for people to go back to the workforce after they take the time they need. Uh, for most people who need paid family and medical leave, they have to take time whether or not it's paid. Uh, so having it paid means that they have enough time to really recover and get back to work. And hopefully they will also have some kind of job protection so they are able to rejoin the job that they've trained for and worked in for a period of time. Paid family medical leave will strengthen infant brain development. It helps with senior independence by allowing seniors to live in their homes longer, which is what most seniors want to do. Um, but it gives their children or their loved ones a chance to be with them to help them recover and maybe to help set up their home in a better way so that they are able to stay in the home. Aid family medical leave will also lower infant maternal mortality. It lowers racial health disparities and it lowers infant care costs. Um, and certainly child care is another big topic right now. I'm sure in Maine, I know it is nationally. And having access to paid family and medical leave makes life a lot easier for the parents of infants. You can find out all of these facts and more um, at our website, familyvaluesatwork.org slash facts. So anyone who's interested in learning more, please go there and check that out. Uh, next slide, please. So Maine is not the first state to be looking at paid family and medical leave, I'm excited to say, because that means that you have a lot of other places to turn to to learn more about what works and what doesn't. And I know Molly is gonna talk a little bit more about the ins and outs of the laws in these different states, but I just want to show where there is coverage right now. 
Um, so paid family medical leave is available in California, Rhode Island, New Jersey. It's in New York and in Washington, DC. Um, it's in Washington state and in Massachusetts. And starting very soon, you'll be seeing it in Connecticut, in Colorado, and in Oregon. There are a number of other states that are looking at this as well. Um, Pennsylvania, Delaware, you all. Um, and we do expect that if we don't see something happen at the federal level, that there will be more states continuing this trend. Paid family and medical leave works in the states. Um, business owners seem to like the law. Workers like the law. So far, it's been a success everywhere that it's been implemented. Next slide, please. One of the things that we talk about at Family Values at Work when we discuss paid family and medical leave is what we call our triple A policy. Every paid family medical leave law, honestly, every paid sick days law too, should include these three A's. And I find them really helpful to think about when I'm looking at a policy and trying to assess if it covers everything that it needs to. So the three A's that we look at are whether a policy is affordable, accessible, and adequate. So an affordable policy is one that creates benefits that workers can afford to use. Something that we've learned from the early states is that if workers do not get enough in benefits to come close to their salary or their wages, they're not able to use the time. And so it ends up that only higher income workers are using this time, even though all workers are paying into it. You also want to create a program that provides job protection. Um, if there's not a job to go back to, it's hard for a worker to think of it as being an affordable program. An accessible program covers all workers. So um, no matter what industry you're in, no matter what your attachment to the workforce might be, if you are working, having access to the program is important. It also covers all types of leave. So rather than saying you can only take this for parental leave, or you can only take it for family leave, but not to care for yourself, that makes it less accessible. So you want to make sure all leave is covered. And finally, it covers all kinds of families. Um, what we think of as family changes from person to person, but we know that we need to be available to take care of the people we love. And we've seen in the States, the definition of family has grown and changed over time. Um, if you think about the Family Medical Leave Act at the national level, that really only covers yourself, your partner, your children, uh, your children under 18, I should say, and your parents. That means that it's leaving out siblings, it's leaving out grandparents and grandchildren, it's leaving out all of different types of people that you care for who may not have been in that traditional model of a nuclear family, but are so important to all of us. Um, we've seen some change on this at the national level with the FFCRA that was in place last year during COVID, which allowed some expansion of what a family might look like. We've seen that expansion in the states as well. It's worked tremendously well and is super important for any good policy. And then finally, adequacy, meaning that there needs to be enough time to bond or heal under paid family and medical leave. Having this time is so important for anyone who is facing an illness or a medical issue. Making sure there's enough time is also really important so people are not coming back before they're fully healed. Next slide, please. I'm gonna to touch also here on implementation because it is incredibly important to any law that passes. Um, a law truly is only as good as its implementation. Um, if workers don't know about it, if they don't feel comfortable using it, then it's not, it's not reaching the full number of people that it could. So true success in paid leave will mean workers knowing about the law and feeling able to use those benefits. And what we've learned in the other states is that workers and employers need to learn about the law from people they trust, and they need to see people using it successfully. So there are definitely roles for the state um, in making this happen. Some of that is around developing really clear regulations and simple applications. It's also listening to the workers and to the employers who are going to use this program to really think about what will make the most sense for them and making this easy to use and easy to understand. I would also say that it's really important um, to make sure to continue that listening and continue working 
with everyone, even after the law has passed, so that there are ways to make updates if things aren't working exactly the way that was planned. There's also a huge role for members of the community in this law. Um, they are able to partner with the state around outreach and education, because certainly what we've learned in the past is that um, many workers, even if they hear from the state, yes, this law is for everyone, they don't always believe it's for them. If you're in an industry that has never had paid family medical leave before, it's easy to think that this law is only for the doctors and lawyers of the world and not for people who are working in retail or service or at a restaurant. So it's important to hear not only from the state, but also from people who they trust that, yes, you can use this and it will work for you. The same is true for businesses. There are going to be a lot of businesses who have human resources departments who can help figure this out. But there will also be businesses who um, who don't, quite frankly, who are just, you know, one employer uh, who is taking on the HR part as well as everything else. And that employer is going to need to know too that yes, this works, here's what you need to do. And they probably need to hear about it again, not just from the state, but from people that they trust. The community is also able to work with the state on sharing successful tactics and solving problems. They are there to bring back anything that they're hearing about people who don't understand the program, who are having a problem on the website. Um, and it, we've seen in other states, really successful programs have a lot of communication between people in the community and with the state itself. So I'm going to stop here and turn it over to Molly, who I think is going to get a little bit more in depth about paid family and medical leave. I'm putting up my website right here for a second if you have any questions. Um, and I will be here, of course, to answer questions as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marianne. Um, and I'm going to ask um, my colleague, Cassandra Gomez, who's going to tag team uh, this presentation with me, has very kindly put our slides on the screen. Um, so thank you so much um, for inviting us this morning. Thank you, Marianne, for kicking us off and really looking forward to this conversation. Um, can we head to the next slide, Cassandra? Um, so for those of you who don't know us, a Better Balance is a national legal and policy nonprofit organization with offices around the country. Um, our legal team has been working on paid family and medical leave and related issues throughout the country for over a decade. And that includes having worked really closely with state partners to draft, pass, and implement paid leave laws around the country. Um, and that's given us a really particular perspective on sort of where the trends are, where best practices are. Um, and that's really translated into the other half of our work, which is we have a free and confidential legal helpline through which we hear from workers all around the country each and every day who have questions about their rights or are having trouble accessing them. And that combination of experiences I think has given us uh, a sort of 360 perspective on how the things that we write on the drafting side really translate into actual results for workers and employers. Um, and we hope to share some of that perspective today. Um, can we head to the next slide? Uh, as Marianne pointed out, there are now 10 state paid leave laws on the books comprehensively, plus um, Hawaii's standalone TDI law. Um, of those, seven are already fully implemented. Um, Connecticut is coming down the pike very shortly. Um, Connecticut will start accepting applications on December 1st and start paying out benefits on January 1st. Uh, and Colorado and Oregon are just a little bit behind. And we'll talk more about those timelines in a moment. Next slide, please. So with this, um, what we were really hoping to do here is to just give sort of a sense of what some of the key policy dimensions and decisions are for states to make and to give you a sort of an overview of here's what different states have done on these pieces. Here's the places where sort of everyone does things the same. Here's where there's more variation. Um, I'll say before I kick it over um, to my colleague to dive into that, that we're going to give you a lot of information in a very short period of time. Um, so we want to make sure that you know that we have a lot of written materials that we're happy to share. In particular, um, if you have questions about how exactly does state X do this particular thing, um, A, we're happy to answer those questions here. But B, um, we have a very detailed comparative chart um, on our website that goes through exactly what each and every state does for each of these pieces that we're happy to share as a resource. Um, and with that, I'm gonna throw it over to my colleague, Cassandra Gomez, who's a staff attorney with A Better Balance. Thanks, Molly. Um, and thank you so much again to the commission for having us today. Um, so just to jump right in, uh, this first slide takes a look at uh, the workers that states with paid family and medical leave laws 
cover or include within the scope of the law's protections. So you'll see that all states cover nearly all private sector or non-government employees. And some states cover public sector employees um, or allow government employers to opt into coverage. And so this means that um, while they may not be automatically covered by the law, employers can elect to be covered. So um, government employers can elect to be covered in, in some states. All states cover employees regardless of their employer's size, as well as at least some domestic workers. Um, and lastly, some states, uh, or sorry, most states allow self-employed workers, um, such as independent contractors or freelancers, to opt into coverage. Now next, um, we're, we're going to talk about covered purposes. So these are reasons for which leave can be used by workers. Um, so just to take a look at what states are doing here, um, all states cover uh, leave for a worker's own serious health need, which is common, commonly known as uh, medical leave. Um, all states also cover bonding with a new child, which I know Marianne mentioned, um, as well as caring for a seriously ill loved one. Um, and also in all states, uh, leave to bond with a new child is available to parents of any gender and is also available to foster and adoptive parents. And most states also cover leave for military family needs in connection with deployment. And this is similar to the FMLA. So if that sounds familiar, um, you might've heard from, about, about it from there. Um, and four states, uh, New Jersey, Connecticut, Oregon, and Colorado, also cover certain non-medical needs when workers or their family members are victims of sexual or domestic violence. And this is often referred to as safe leave. And so I know, for example, that might sound familiar to you all because uh, Maine has a, a safe leave law on the books. Um, so now uh, I'm gonna turn to something else that I know that Marianne touched on, um, which is uh, the family definition. So every paid family and medical leave law specifies the family members for whom workers can take leave to care for when the family member has a serious health condition. So in this next slide that I'll turn to, um, we'll take a close look at what relationships uh, family definitions tend to cover in, in states with paid family and medical leave laws. So you'll see here that all states with paid family and medical leave laws cover at least the following members of a worker's family. So a worker's spouse, a parent, children regardless of age, grandparent, parent-in-law, and um, at least some domestic partners, though exact definitions there may vary between, for example, some states may require registration, some states may not. Um, and almost all states cover a worker's sibling and grandchild. And in half of the states, um, New Jersey, Connecticut, Oregon, Colorado, and Washington, workers can also take leave to care for other loved ones to whom they may have a close association or significant personal bond with um, that is the equivalent of a family relationship or um, with whom there's an expectation of care, regardless of legal or biological relation. And so exact definitions there vary, but um, this language is typically based off of the family definition that the federal government uses for the federal workforce. And this will cover relationships like unmarried partners or um, a, close, uh, a close friend who feels like a sibling to, to the worker. So really persons that um, you're expected to care for and build close bonds with. And so moving right along, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit now about number of weeks um, that workers can receive uh, paid family and medical leave benefits for. So the maximum number of weeks tends to vary based on the worker's need for leave. So for example, um, nearly all states provide at least 12 weeks of benefits for a worker's own serious health needs. And half of the states provide more than 12 weeks for a worker's own serious health needs. Um, most states also provide 12 weeks of benefits for bonding and caregiving purposes, um, as well as uh, deployment related needs where, where applicable. 
Also, nearly all states allow workers to combine benefits in instances where the worker has more than one qualifying need um, so that workers may be able to receive more than a total of 12 weeks of benefits per year. So next I'll talk just briefly about um, wage replacement rate, which is the percentage of income that workers receive while on leave. And to be clear, this is a percentage of the worker's own established income that they receive while they're on leave. Um, so in every state paid family and medical leave program, um, excuse me, in every state with paid family and medical leave programs, benefits are subject to a cap. Um, and that cap is typically uh, a percentage of the state's average weekly wage. So you'll see here that um, in states with paid family and medical leave programs, seven use what's called a progressive wage replacement rate. And that's where lower income workers will receive a higher percentage of their incomes while on leave. And so in these programs, um, the highest wage replacement rate varies from 70% in California uh, to 100% in Oregon. Um, and then there's a sliding scale for higher income workers in those states. And then in three states, um, there's uh, the same rep wage replacement rate for all workers, um, again, up to a cap. Now for eligibility requirements, um, this, this really envisions how covered workers um, with a need for leave become eligible for paid family and medical leave benefits. Um, and these tend to be similar to what you might expect from an unemployment insurance program. So eligibility requirements typically set a, a minimum amount of income, uh, time worked or both to qualify for paid family and medical leave benefits. Let's take a closer look here at the eligibility requirements. Um, seven states with paid family and medical leave laws uh, set eligibility based on minimum earnings. So the worker must meet a minimum earnings requirement to qualify for benefits. And in some states, income must be earned over a certain period of time. So um, for example, with over, over a period um, of, uh, over, for example, like a, a quarterly period. Um, and nearly all states with paid family and medical leave programs, um, benefits are portable. So this means that workers can keep their benefits as they move from job to job, or they can combine multiple sources of income. And also almost all states allow previously covered workers to access benefits during periods of unemployment. So this is particularly important because this is a program that um, workers pay into. Um, so in, in those instances, these all speak to portability, which allow workers to, to keep their benefits um, as, they, as they go along. So next here, um, I'll touch briefly on employment protections, um, which most states provide uh, at least some form of. And so these protections um, can include uh, the right to get your job back following, following a period of leave, um, protection against retaliation or interference with leave taking, and also continuation of health insurance coverage during leave. So when I mean employment protections, I mean all of those things. Um, and I'll show you now in the next slide what states are doing um, as far as employment protection protections go. So you'll see that four states, um, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Oregon, and Colorado, give workers the right to return to work following paid family and paid medical leave. And in some of these states, um, there may be just a short employment duration requirement to qualify for those employment protections. Then in New York and Rhode Island, um, both of these states provide the right to return to work to all workers taking paid family and medical leave under their laws. Or sorry, excuse me, paid family leave under their laws. And then most state programs provide some form of protection against retaliation for workers that exercise their rights under the law. And lastly, typically, um, states that protect a worker's right to return to work 
also protect a worker's health insurance while they're on their leave so that workers are able to um this is this is critical um for workers who are taking paid family and medical leave um so that they still have access to their health insurance although they're they're taking leave and so now i'll turn it back to molly thanks so much cassandra um, so we just had a couple more points um, that we were hoping to touch on. Um, so one is I know there's been a lot of questions around how these kinds of programs are funded. Um, so big picture, and I apologize, you're going to hear my toddler in the background, a little bit of an occupational hazard. Um, all state paid family and medical leave laws are paid for through small payroll contributions into an insurance system. And we'll talk more about what those systems look like in a couple slides. Um, whether those contributions are paid for by employees, employers, or some combination of both. Um, these contributions are typically set as a percentage of workers' wages, um, which is adjusted annually, often up to some kind of maximum annual contribution. And if we can pop to the next slide, we can talk a little more about exactly how that works out. And again, we're happy to talk in more detail or provide more resources about exactly what this looks like in different places. Um, so in six states, employers and employees share the cost of the program. So you have both employers and employees paying into that insurance system, though exactly how that split breaks down varies by state. Um, in four of those six, smaller employers don't have to pay the employer share of the contribution. So um, in four states, Washington, Massachusetts, Colorado, and Oregon, um, basically what the state decided is, is we wanna cut a break for smaller employers and exactly what that definition is varies by state. And so they said, even though normally employers and employees share the cost, we're going to designate a category of small employers. Um, the largest is uh, 50 employees, Colorado, it'll be only those under 10. Um, everyone else is in between. Um, and say for those employers, employees still pay in the same amount they pay anywhere else. They're not paying more. Um, but the employers don't have to pay the employer share. They may get the benefits of the program for free uh, for those small employers. Um, those small employers are still 100% covered exactly the same way as anyone else. It's just that the state has decided to exempt them from paying into the system. Uh, in three states, California, Rhode Island, and Connecticut, employees cover the full cost of the program, so only employees are paying into the system. And in D.C., largely for legal reasons that wouldn't apply in Maine, uh, employers cover the full cost of the program, so only employers pay into the system in D.C. You can turn to the next slide. So exactly what the amount of the contribution is varies by state and in response to the program's parameters. So when you think about all of those variations that Cassandra talked about before, unsurprisingly, if you have a program that has a lot more weeks or a much more generous wage replacement, that's gonna cost a little bit more in your contributions than a program that is a little less generous. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities for states in this kind of policy making to strike the balance that's right for them in terms of affordability of the program versus exactly where you want to set those parameters. Um, in most states, the total contribution to so the total amount that's getting paid in on workers' wages, which may be split between employers and employees, uh, are under 1% of employees' wages um, per year, often up to a cap. Um, so to give one example um, of a state that has uh, a very solid program, uh, Washington State, which launched their program in 2020, um, they started off with a contribution that was around a half a percent split between uh, employers and employees. After their first year, even with really robust use, they were actually able to take it down just a little bit to 0.4%. And for next year, it's going up just a little tiny bit to 0.6%. So again, we're talking about a very small amount, which is typically split, which means the amount that an employer or employee you're paying in is even smaller than that. And next slide, please. So as we alluded to um, a few slides ago, all of the existing state paid leave programs create a system where contributions are made for each employee into an insurance system that then provides benefits when needed. So the benefit of having been paying into the system or as employers or employees is that if I'm a worker and I have a need that comes up, so I um, need to have surgery and I'm gonna need some time to recover, when I need to get paid while I'm having that surgery, my employer isn't having to pay me while I'm out. This insurance system is going to be paying my benefits. Um, while I'm away. Typically, um, the way that this looks is that states create a state insurance fund to provide the benefits, um, and that's where everyone's paying their money. Um, in some cases, in addition to that option um, of the state-run insurance fund, states will allow employers to get approval to provide exactly those state-required benefits privately 
um, either through self-insurance or through commercial insurance policies, subject to a whole set of safeguards. And we're happy to talk in more detail about that if that's helpful. Um, next slide, please. Um, so we wanted to speak just briefly uh, and Marianne set us up so well with talking so much about the importance of implementation, about just sort of what a timeline looks like um, for how we go from the state of Maine passes a law into Maine workers are actually getting these benefits. Um, so we've included on the slide here, um, these are the six programs that have passed in states that didn't have a pre-existing TDI, temporary disability insurance program, which several of the earlier states had. Um, so these are states that we think of as sort of comparable to Maine in the sense of sort of starting from scratch on their program. Um, and what you'll see in this range, um, including you'll see many of these states are already fully implemented or close to, we've got a couple that are still in the process, um, is that a typical time frame from passage to workers actually receiving benefits is in the sort of two and a half to three and a half year range. Um, some of that is just give the time to set up the system. So the state will need to hire folks, set up a claims process, all that stuff. Some of that time, as you'll see here, is also to create that fund. So in order for the system to pay folks out benefits, it needs to have the money already in the system. So you need some time um, for money to build up in that fund. And we're happy to talk more about sort of what the um, places to tweak are and where the opportunities are on the timeline. But I think that gives you a good ballpark. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so as I mentioned, we have a ton of additional resources on our website. We're happy to send around um, all of these links. But we just want to make sure that you know that there's a lot more information available, including some of that sort of state by state um, comparison. Since if we went through what each and every state does on each and every one of these parameters, you'd be here all morning um, and we want to be respectful of your time. Um, and with that, if we can just go to the last slide, um, here's our contact information. And again, we're really happy um, to take any questions. Thank you so much. Um, with that, jump right in. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Representative Stearns. Uh, thank you. And uh, I, I first would like to just comment that that was extremely informative. Uh, really appreciate the presentation. I'm wondering if there, uh, uh, in states, in any of the states where they have a government collective bargaining agreement, for instance, may, it might be a municipal fire department or a local school system, uh, and they adopt this statewide paid family leave, if you will, does that then usurp the collective bargaining agreement in other words, if there, are, if there are caps and limitations at the state level, and perhaps the local collective bargaining agreement goes far above and beyond that, does that bring that back into check or how do those relate? Uh, I'm happy to speak to that. Um, so first, I think whether we're talking private sector, public sector, whoever, um, state laws do not, and I would say legally cannot, take away anything to which folks are entitled. Um, under a collective bargaining agreement, it could be a violation of federal law to do that. Um, but what can happen is um, we tend to think of these laws for whoever they're covered. And I'll talk uh, in a second about a nuance around public sector workers as we're creating a floor, not a ceiling. Um, so if you had um, a collective bargaining agreement that gave you less than what the state law provides uh, and you are covered by the state law, your employer is still covered by the law in the same way as if you had a collective bargaining agreement um, that guaranteed you pay that was lower than minimum wage, and then the state raised the minimum wage, you'd still get the rate required by law. Um, so I think that's the way to think about it, is that if the CBA entitles you to something, the state is not taking that away. Um, but we, there are circumstances where it may raise the floor. Um, I think your question was particularly focused on public sector workers. Um, and I'll say here, um, states are kind of all over the map um, in terms of how they've decided to cover or not cover public sector workers. Um, there are a handful of states that have just covered all public sector workers um, or all state employees in the same way as other employees. Um, some states have exempted those employees altogether, sometimes because of particular concerns around collective bargaining agreements. Um, in states that do that, typically there's some kind of an option for public sector employers to opt back in um, to the system to provide the benefits um, through the state. Um, often that's connected with the bargaining process. So um, in a state like California does this this way, um, New York similarly, um, it's essentially it becomes part of the bargaining process and the, the parties get to negotiate over whether or not to include that coverage. And I think that's a, um, 
for public sector workers, that's a decision point for the state to think about. Um, in terms of, I think our our recommendation is certainly that best practice is to cover absolutely everyone, um, including public sector workers. But we recognize that there are some special considerations there, including that public sector workers may already have fairly robust rights under either collective bargaining agreements or other state policies. Um, so does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions? I have a question. Right this is Benita. Um, could you tell me, I'm just interested in how the states are handling this. You're talking about setting up a separate department or the insurance company. So I'm just curious, what are the states that have implemented these doing? And I'm happy to speak to that, but I think maybe the end of your question got cut off and I want to make sure I'm capturing all of it. So I was just asking, how are, this, how are the states that have implemented these programs, how are they running them? Are they doing it through the state, through an insurance company? Have they set up their own separate departments? How is that being run? I'm just wondering about cost effectiveness of that. Of course, thank you. Um, so typically what states do is either they set up a, a separate state agency or a part of an existing state agency to operate the program. Um, so for example, it's pretty common to set up a new part of like your state department of labor. Um, some states have decided to set up new state or quasi-state agencies, like Connecticut, for example, has set up a new state agency. Um, typically, um, that means that the states are operating the program at large, they're collecting the money, they're running the main fund. Um, that's by far the, the standard approach. Some states have decided to contract out for discrete pieces of that, and there's some challenges um, involved in that. And um, so typically when we say contract net, we're talking about things like um, contracting out the IT um, to build the software, that kind of stuff. Um, and typically that's in the same way that the state does for other things. Um, that what we have not seen, and probably have not seen um, writ large is something like we contract out the whole program. Um, the state that's done the most robust contracting out, and this is still sort of a, a work in progress, um, is Connecticut has contracted out just the claims processing piece. It's a discrete piece of it. Um, and I would say, and I, I should be clear here, uh, speaking on behalf of a better balance and not the paid leave authority, um, I, what I would say is I think it's new. Um, Connecticut hasn't started paying out benefits yet. So I think no one has the data about what that looks like because it hasn't happened yet. Um, but that is not the typical approach. Um, and I will say it was a, a contested decision. Uh, in Connecticut, typically states have said, we know how to pay up benefits. We do it for unemployment insurance, for example. We want to build that capacity. We want to do that through high quality state jobs. Um, so that's been the typical approach. Um, most states include some option for the state is running a program and that's the default to cover everybody. But if a particular employer says, we want to provide the same high quality benefits privately, they're typically a process to get approved to do that. But by and large, very clearly, what states are doing is we set up a program, we run a program. There's sometimes some opportunities to, under that oversight, provide those benefits privately. If I could add to that quickly, um, we have partnered with CLASP, and I'm sure we've partnered with the Better Balance as well to look at this issue. Um, and we do have a report looking at, you know, public versus private provision of uh, these benefits. And I'd be happy to share that with the group later on. Um, and certainly we can see if anyone who worked on that report would be available to speak to the group at a later date. That would be very helpful to see. Thank you. Yeah, I was going to echo that, that that would be very, very helpful. So thank you. Up next, I had Barbara followed by Emily. This is a question from Marianne, which is, you said it's been a success everywhere it's been implemented. Can you talk a little bit more to that? And, you know, particularly what I'm thinking about is from the employer point of view, um, because I can see where that would feel like a, a challenge. It's, an, it's another um, payment that they have to be involved in, another administrative burden for them. So to speak about that. And secondly, it, it seems like it's a pretty low percent of wages that are engaged, but have employees had any concerns or questions about um, about it. 
Sure. Yeah. So, um, of course, I'm speaking very broadly. I'm sure if you wanted to go to any of these states, you could eventually find one person who's going to say something different than I would. Um, from the employer side first, what we have seen in the states that have had this program long enough to go back in and talk to the employers is that employers generally have either a positive or a neutral frame around this type of law once it's passed and implemented. Um, yes, there may be a little bit more work on the side of the employers, depending on how the law goes through um, and certainly depending on uh, how payment might be done. But that being said, again, most workers who use this law are going to need paid family or going to need family medical leave, I should say, whether or not this law is in place. Um, people still have babies. They still get diagnosed with cancer they still have a sudden medical issue that requires a hospitalization. So what a lot of employers will come to see is that by having this law in place, they're actually able to keep the folks that they have trained over the years. And instead of having to think about a new hiring process or lose all of this training that they've done, um, they're able to continue to keep that employee and that employee is able to come back after a certain period of time. And by and large, I feel like that's what most employers want to do. Certainly, that's what they will say when you're talking to them. They don't, no one wants to go through a hiring process. Um, you want to hold on to the person you have and you want to get them back to work when they can. And you honestly, most of the time, have a relationship with them and you want to see them do well. You don't want them to be struggling while they're doing chemo. Um, so for a lot of reasons, this works out well for employers. For workers, by and large, um, some workers honestly don't even realize that this amount is being deducted because it is so small uh, and the benefits are so large, especially, again, as we are learning more and making sure that lower income workers are getting a higher percentage of their pay when they are able to use the benefits, um, it, it makes a really big difference. Can, can I ask a follow-up question to that? Sure. Um, one of the things you say is that people are going to take the leave anyways. And I think that that's true to an extent. But as a pediatrician, I certainly watch lots of parents, um, more mothers and fathers, but lots of parents not take the leave they wanted because they couldn't afford to. Um, sure. So I would assume that once you put a, this in place, the amount of leave that is taken increases. Yes, absolutely. So when I say they're going to take the leave anyway, what I mean more is that people are not using it for things that they can postpone. Um, but you, we know right now that um, I think it's one in four mothers are back in back to work two weeks after having a baby, which is ludicrous. So certainly uh, we're going to see people taking somewhat longer leave and hopefully having the time they need to heal and to care for others. And Molly, I'm not sure if there's stuff that you want to add to this too, because I know you know a lot about it as well. So I think that that, that exact point, and, and thank you, Dr. Crowley, for bringing that up, that I think we're seeing both um, some circumstances in which workers just can't avoid it. Like I think there, there's circumstances in which you're sick in a way where you can't keep working a loved one is taken away where you, you can't keep working, but there's also lots and lots of situations in which people are not taking as much leave as they'd like to, in which people are putting off leave longer than they probably should have. You know, you're, you're waiting to have that surgery that you need because you're waiting to have the time, the money saved up to be away from work. Um, and so I think we, we see it as both. We, we see it as both. We're covering unavoidable circumstances and we're ensuring that people can take the time that they need. And I think to Marianne's point, like we're talking about circumstances where people really need um, to be away. And I think just to your question about sort of impact on employers, um, I think if we do it right, if we structure these systems right, we're really creating a resource for employers. Um, number one, administratively, um, if you have a state system that is evaluating claims, it's looking at the medical evidence, it's making sure people really qualify, that's something employers don't have to worry about. That's a, a resource that the state is providing, the state is doing that processing for you. Um, so it's not your time and energy being put into to doing that processing and evaluation. Um, and the second thing I would say there is, if I'm an employer and I have a worker who is out taking leave, because the insurance system is paying that worker while they're out, I still have that money in my bank account that I otherwise would have been paying that worker as salary or wages. And as the employer, I get to use that however I see fit um, to help me, whether that's I give extra hours to workers, I give some folks overtime, whether that's I'm just rearranging how folks are working. Um, so really, I think when we structure these programs, right, and we follow these models that have been time-tested in the states, 
Um, I think what the data really shows, what employer survey after employer survey really shows is it can truly be a win-win um, for employers and workers because the state is taking on some of those burdens and the insurance system is handling the payment, which means we're giving employers, um, I think, less administrative burden on the whole uh, and more flexibility because you have that money in your bank account still while still taking care of your worker in the way that you want to, which I think Marianne is absolutely right that um, I think the vast, vast, overwhelming majority of employers want to take care of their workers. They've invested in them. They want to do right by people. It's just a question of whether they can afford it. And this is really the state stepping in to give you a resource to have your back as an employer to make sure you can't afford it. Thank you, important reminders. Um, up next, Emily, followed by Wendy. Um, yeah, I just have a couple of questions. Um, related to low wage workers, um, how have they been defined in other states? And has there been any consideration of uh, waiving premiums for low wage workers, um, similar to waiving premiums for employers that have you know, a certain number of employees or less? Sure. Um, so typically when we talk about sort of legal definitions around low income workers in states, different surveys measure them different ways. Um, the way that states have done this is they've created a sliding scale for the wage replacement. So if you make less, you get a greater chunk uh, of your own income and then it declines over time. Um, and states have really varied on this. Uh, frankly, like it's, um, we'll, we'll um, send around our chart, which we'll show you, but it's a really, there, there's sort of no quite typical answer. Um, several states have said, we're going to give you that higher percentage um, of your income up to 50% of the state average weekly wage. And then it's a sliding scale from there. Um, other states have done it in relation to say their state minimum wage um, or some percentage or high percentage there. Some states have done a slightly different fraction. Um, so it's been measured in a lot of different ways, but I think what we've seen consistently, particularly in the newer states is a real focus on affordability and accessibility for low-income workers, and I think to Marianne's point, that was one of the real lessons learned from earlier states. So particularly you look at um, early data from California, um, which previously had a 55% wage replacement rate. And there was good research that said that's too low, that lower-income workers, even a lot of middle-income workers just can't afford to have their income basically cut in half, um, which is why California went back and raised their rate. Um, so that's been sort of where the focus has been. Um, in terms of a premium exemption, um, no state has done that yet, um, but there's no um, sort of technical reason they couldn't. I think it's all a question of just sort of balancing um, habits all worked out. I think in general, and I, I believe this was brought up earlier, the, the sense has been particularly in the newer programs that the overall rate is low enough. And because it's a percentage of income, it's already sort of self-scaling. So lower income workers are paying less because the same percentage is a smaller dollar figure. Um, but it's it's something to consider. I think there's trade-offs in terms of how complicated you're making that, but I think it all kind of comes down to the math um, of what does that mean for the overall rate and what does that mean for program complexity? But I think it's an option to really consider. And I think certainly um, I appreciate the commission's clear focus on creating a program that's gonna work for all workers, including low-income workers. Real quick, I'm gonna uh, jump right in front of you, Wendy, just because I wanna ask yeah. a follow-up because you know, what you're saying is that you know, California went back, most states are changing their rates after they see how it works. I'm just wondering, there are no states currently that um, you, know, you have the progressive sliding sale on some of them, but none of them are necessarily linked to sort of the average cost of living. It's more linked to the median wage data. Correct? Yeah, so there's, um, in states that have a progressive wage replacement, which at this point is most states, um, that the way that the progressiveness works um, which is sort of, a, yeah, I think the way that the progressiveness works is typically tied to either state wage distribution to some kind of state average weekly wage percentage um, or to minimum wage. State average weekly wage is a bad proxy for cost of living, but it's like kind of somewhere in the ballpark. Um, and at least that has the benefit of, it means that the rates automatically adjust each year. Um, so you're not, for example, saying, you know, you, you wouldn't want to write into a law it's 50% of your income up, it's 90% of your income up to $500 a week. And then 10 years from now, that's not the right place to put it. So that has its self-adjust each year and also has its self-adjust each year in relation to main specific data, um, which is gonna, we hope target there. But again, this is a place where I think there's room to consider other options um, in terms of exactly how you set those rates. 
Thank you. And that, that was exactly my question because, you know, and building off of what Emily said, that concern about whether that, that wage data, and this is obviously where I defer more to Commissioner Portman and all the information she has available of whether that's that accurate reflection of the cost of, you know, you know, cost of living in Brunswick is going to be different than it is going to be in like Kittery or, you know, Holton. So that's one of those things that I'm always concerned about making sure we reflect that in the process. Um, and you actually, you've reminded me that I should have mentioned that um, DC actually, the way that they're um, some of their their pieces, not the progressiveness, but their cap, um, adjust in relation to local inflation. Um, so that might be another model to think about. Thank you. And uh, Wendy, sorry to jump ahead there. No, that's fine. Thank you. I just wanted to offer um, our company's experience with uh, this issue in a number of different states. Um, following our last meeting, I did go back and talk to the people at LL Bean who actually administer uh, this program. And we experience it in states where we have both um, a private insurer running that program for us, or we're dealing directly with the state. So we have both experiences. And, and I would say that our, our personal experience at the company has been that it does work more smoothly for the employer when there is a private insurer running that for you. They have a lot of experience with claims management. And so that, that experience has really benefited employees and the employer, I would say. And um, the people who run this program said, you know, their, their suggestion for the commission would be to pay attention to simplicity in eligibility, the calculation of the benefit, who is covered for the family part of the leave, um, and then of course the, ma the management and administration. But um, it works incredibly well. Employees do seem to understand it and are having a very good experience taking advantage of our programs. So I think we have um, four states currently where we support that. So I just wanted to offer that. I didn't have a question right now. I think you're on mute, Maddie. It isn't a Zoom meeting until it's happened to at least one or two exactly. people. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. And that's really good to know. Um, Sorry, did you say me? Okay. Um, so I just had one other question. Um, I think it was Marianne at the beginning mentioned um, that these programs can lower racial disparities in healthcare. And I'm curious, can you elaborate on exactly how that addresses that and like what specific things are needed to pay, like do we need to pay attention to in order to ensure that that's the case? Sure, yeah, and I definitely want to refer people again back to our website and our facts page where you can find some more details on this. I'm happy to send around some studies as well. Um, in general, having access to paid family and medical leave currently, um, you will end up seeing the people who have it right now tend to be in um, full-time jobs, in um, management positions, in jobs that typically honestly end up being um, jobs where you will see higher numbers of white people working. Um, and what you will see a lot of the time is that uh, BIPOC workers may be more often in jobs that do not have access to paid family and medical leave. So certainly just having access to the leave for everybody right there helps level the playing field quite a bit. Um, it makes it easier for workers to then have access to go to the doctor when they need to, to stay home and heal and care for others longer term. Um, having paid family and medical leave makes it easier, for instance, to go with your parent or your partner to um, cancer treatment and to ask the questions and just to um, make sure that, that care is happening, provide some of that extra care that otherwise may not be there. Um, and because we know that um, so many times extra advocacy is necessary, uh, it, it makes a really big difference for all workers and particularly I think for BIPOC workers um, to have an extra person with them. I feel like I'm not fully covering this question. I want to, um, let me pull out some more information, send it over to you rather than just trying to think it through in my head right now. And Molly, certainly if you have yeah. other things, please do. 
Yeah, I think there's two things that I would flag in addition to 100% agreeing with everything Marianne said. The first is that um, there's research particularly um, from Pew, um, which shows that workers of color, especially black workers, are more likely to have an unmet need for leave in a given year, whether unmet means they're allowed to take the leave, but it's unpaid and they can't afford to take it or they just don't have access at all. Um, which is why that thoughtfully designed uh, programs with a focus on equity can really bridge a lot of that gap. Um, the other place is one just specific example to really think about here um, is black maternal mortality, um, where we know, and I think we've all seen the headlines, that there are, are truly outrageous gaps. And I think um, particularly the number of black women who die or suffer long-term consequences as a result of childbirth is, is really kind of outrageous. Um, and what paid leave can do is it gives, it gives workers more options. So if your doctor is recommending that you go on bed rest prior to delivery and you don't have the paid leave there to enable that, or you're thinking about, I'm trying to save up all my sick days so I can use them when the baby comes, you're not going to be able to necessarily make the choices that are right for you and your family. And paid leave gives you that option. And similarly, um, and there's a great, um, there's a New York Times piece out day before yesterday, I think, that starts with something like, the headline is something like parental leave saved my life. Um, for lots of folks, and I think, again, here, there's some clear racial disparities. Um, you also need time to recover, particularly if you have some kind of complication in relation to childbirth. Um, and so having paid leave also gives you that additional resource on that end, um, not just for all of the reasons that we know paid leave is so important um, for bonding with your children, as you can hear both my children in the background now, um, but also childbirth is a, a significant medical event um, in the best of circumstances and can be a life threatening event in not the best of circumstances. And I think given what we know about the racial disparities there, it's all the more important to assure that all workers, but particularly workers of color, have access to the paid leave they need um, in relation to their own health writ large. But I think uh, maternal mortality is one really clear example there. Thank you. Commissioner Fortman. So um, I'm not sure if this is a question from Molly or Marianne or, or both of you, um, and it's about data. Um, the the um, examples that you've given us are primarily from large states. In the and so I was trying to find like a state that looked kind of like Maine here, and I think the closest I could come to that was Rhode Island. And Rhode Island, as you said, had a temporary disability insurance program before that they built onto. And I'm just trying to, you know, we talked about some split between perhaps between employers and employees for cost. And so I was just curious about, have you looked at smaller states? Have you seen something about how, um, you know, would the, how would that impact cost? And then the other question that I had um, is that one of your principles is that if you're doing paid leave, it should cover everyone for all reasons, whether it's birth, adoption of a child, or for your own or someone else's medical condition. Are there different costs if you just did a piece of it? I, I, I think I had read somewhere that the covering birth or adoption was perhaps less expensive. And I'm just wondering, Maine is an older state. H how do those costs play out in a state like ours? Or are there any differences? Sure, I'm, I'm happy to kick this off and then um, Mary can certainly jump in. Um, I think we do, um, we have some, some good data out of Rhode Island, um, which has been providing some forms of paid leave since um, the mid forties. Um, so we've got some good data there. I think we're just starting to see um, the data emerging out of DC, which is also a quite small um, population, Washington State sort of somewhere in the middle. So we've got we've got some good information there. I think on costs, um, I, typically our, our sense has been that the size of a state is not a huge factor in terms of premium costs because um, fewer people are paying in, but also you're paying out fewer benefits. Um, so for example, in sort of the total dollars of the program, of course, California is going to be a lot more expensive than Maine because there's a whole lot more people in California. Um, but it sort of balances itself out in terms of the rate because it's um, the number of people paying in basically sort of equal out to people paying out. So the, the rate itself more or less kind of self-corrects. The, the size of the state is not a huge factor there, at least in what we've seen. Um, I think in terms of cost based on purposes, um, there are some states that provide data that could let you differentiate out some of that. Um, I think it's helpful always to start with the fact that 
what the data over only shell in, in virtual other programs in the FMLA is that what a majority of people use paid leave for is their own non-pregnancy related serious health needs. Um, so we say family and medical all the time, but I sometimes wonder if we should be saying medical and family because um, that's how people really experience it. So I think when we're thinking about, for example, a state's demographics, um, folks are only welcoming new children into their life, a, you know, maybe a few times and often only in a certain phase of life, but caregiving can happen at any point in the lifespan. And certainly your own, like you could get cancer at any time, you could get hit by a bus at any time. Um, so when we're thinking about that comprehensive nature, I think it's helpful to think about, um, I think we often um, spend a lot of time talking about parental, which is hugely important, um, but is also sort of only one piece of the puzzle. Um, I, I wonder if it's just because babies are really cute, so we like putting pictures of them uh, on everything we do. But I think in terms of that comprehensiveness, like we, we really agree that to, to accomplish what workers need, you need that full range. It, it's possible in a technical sense to model out the differences in the cost, but I think um, the way that I would think about it is what's the right balance for Maine to strike in terms of what's the level of benefits that's sustainable, that's affordable for Maine to provide that's also going to meet those needs across the lifespan. Yeah, and I wanna just echo 100% what Molly just said. Um, I would say too that from a perspective of a worker paying into a program, um, there are workers out there who are going to say, I've had my kids or I'm never going to have kids or, um, whatever else about children. And so why should I pay into this program if it's not, you know, if I'm not going to be using it at, from a parental standpoint? Uh, so when you, when you expand it to something that covers all types of need, it's a lot easier for people to see, oh, you know, I might need to care for my parent. Um, I might need to care for my sibling. Uh, even, even those folks who might think that they're indestructible have a better sense of why they might be caring for somebody else and why it's important to them. Um, and also spreading it out over the entire population of Maine for all caregiving needs means that everyone is paying in a smaller amount because everyone is part of the program. Um, and so everyone has an, an equal share in it and also has a share in wanting it to succeed. And I think that's really important too. I'm so sorry. If I could also just jump in here while since we were talking about Rhode Island, um, uh, out of the last legislative session, there was a bill to expand the program and up the number of weeks for workers um, to take, which it'll phase in over time and be fully phased in in 2023. Um, and we've seen a number of expansions um, over the years in all of the states that we're talking about. So I just wanted to raise that as well. Thank Can you. I ask another question. Absolutely, go right ahead. Um, so I just am curious, is this just a one-time 12 weeks? I work with the elderly. Consequently, someone could be very sick today and rally, and therefore that person that's taken this leave will not need that whole 12 weeks. Can they, is it just a once in a year? Um, situation or can they go back and do two weeks at a time or I'm just curious how that would work that's number one and the other question the other comment I have is that um, timing I'm just wondering how those states are doing now with the pandemic and people taking off that 12-week period of time because this week I was screamed at twice for customer service questions because people are so stressed in this state with not having enough employees right now. And so I'm just curious, are you having any repercussions from the pandemic now with what's going on with the workers and employees? Sure. So I can, um, I think Marianne also has things to add, but I, I, to the, the pandemic piece, um, I think what we've really seen, and there's um, good research out of the Urban Institute um, here specifically, is that um, in states where there was already a paid leave program in place, particularly some states were able to sort of tweak their programs to respond to the pandemic, workers did better. There were, there were clear benefits for having that. And I think those benefits end up inuring to employers too. Because um, when we talk about challenges in hiring workers, challenges in retaining workers, like study after study is showing that one of the big drivers is that people need to be able to take leave and they're leaving jobs because they can't do it. And so if you have this state resource that's enabling you and paying for um, you to be able to take that leave. I, I think that's really going to be a tool to help employers in combating 
um, some of those challenges because it's going to give that additional um, flexibility in a sustainable and affordable way. Um, writ large, I think what we've seen is that um, there has been some increased use um, of paid leave programs um, in relation to, to COVID-related needs. Some folks have you know, needed it because they are seriously ill and they need to take it um, or need to take leave to care for someone who is seriously ill. Um, a couple of states have done sort of more specific um, COVID-related pieces. Um, and I think we're going to see some of that down the line because there are going to be some folks who are going to have lasting health needs, um, either on a caregiving perspective or for their own because of COVID. Um, which to me is all the more reason to create a sustainable state system to pay for that instead of putting that burden on employers um, to make sure that those folks who, if they want to need to keep working, are able to do that. Um, so I think what we've really seen is that um, the pandemic has really demonstrated both the need and the resilience of these systems to be able to respond um, in those circumstances. And conversely, the data has shown that in states that didn't have paid leave systems in place, workers suffered, the economy suffered, families suffered uh, because that tool wasn't there. Um, to the question about sort of how people can use the time. So when we talk about 12 weeks, um, we, um, we run into problems when we're talking about ranges because it's hard to say like typically up to, but what we tend to mean there is that's the max. So people take what they need. So for example, if you have a caregiving need, maybe that need is going to go to 12 weeks. Maybe it's not. Lots of folks have caregiving needs that are shorter than that. So it's going to be a big range in terms of folks using what they need and typically what's medically documented as what they need. Um, I think part of your question was getting at what if folks need two weeks here, two weeks there, back in circumstances, intermittent leave. Um, so essentially all programs include some option um, for leave being used intermittently subject to some kind of parameters. Um, so for example, if it's for a medical or caregiving need, it's typically, you can use leave intermittently where it's medically necessary um, to do it that way up to whatever the cap is in a year. Um, those caps, exactly how the year is measured is technical in a way that you don't need to worry about right now. But it, typically what that means is in some kind of a 12 year, 12 month period, you have up to that max. If you have another need after the end of that 12 month period, you may be able to do that again. Um, but most folks are not using even a year. Most folks are not using, you know, the overall majority of people aren't going to need it. Um, this year, thus year and a half were a funny time for us because um, a whole lot of people had the same kind of needs all at once. Um, in relation to the pandemic, but that is not normally how the world operates, we hope. Um, so the, the systems are set up to, for that kind of flexibility. So it's set up as number one, you don't have to take it all in one chunk if that's not what makes sense for your health or caregiving need. Um, and number two, that it's not everyone takes 12 weeks. Most people don't take 12 weeks because um, most people don't need 12 weeks um, for their particular need. I think Marianne had other thoughts too. I apologize for jumping yeah, no, um, I that was all great and covered a lot what I was going to say. Um, definitely the intermittent leave is there in most states and is important. Um, as far as how it worked during the pandemic, I just want to add to Molly's great overview that um, th many, you know, the states who had paid family medical leave did do well. Um, we know in general that having access to any kind of paid leave saved lives. Uh, throughout COVID, there are studies on that, that having these programs has made a huge difference just in, in life, which is super important. And I do think that one of the reasons that paid family medical leave is being talked about now at the national level is because we do think that it will bring more people back into the workforce. Um, if you know that your child may be in and out of school over the next whatever because of COVID restrictions, because of quarantine, because of whatever else, it's a lot easier to go back to the workforce if you also know that you will be able to take the time that you need um, when your child has to be home. And I think that's true also for all of the other reasons that people might have to take paid family medical leave. So I'm not, um, you know, different programs have dealt with quarantine in different ways as opposed to um, actually taking care of someone who's ill. But it is, um, it's an important consideration that people are making as they are returning to work after the past 20 months. I, I'm stuck on it being 18 months and it's been more now. Um, and I think it, it is actually going to be really helpful in reducing stress levels of workers and of employers. Thank you. And I'm sorry, Barbara, I missed your hand earlier. So we have Barbara followed by Sarah. And I apologize if anyone's hearing our puppy who you'll see on the screen, but she's running around with a squeaky toy. So hopefully Zoom is not carrying that through. 
we like the puppies and the little kids in the distraction. This may be, this is a naive question. It's partly because I don't work in this space. When I was looking at the materials that were sent out to us, there was a table from uh, A Better Balance. But when we talked about funding, they would cap, they would cap the salary at which they would draw on um, taking, taking a, a piece for the benefit. Why do we cap? Why is there a cap on the salary? I mean, I, I, so that, that's my question. Uh, I think that is not a naive question at all. Um, so what I would say is I think some of the places where you're seeing those kinds of caps on um, the withholding, um, some of that it's because it was a political decision that was made in the 1940s. Uh, and I've done a lot of research into what those decisions were made and it's still not totally clear. Um, I think some states have had the thought of either um, you shouldn't be paying in on more income than you can get the benefit on. We can debate whether that's the place you want to put it, but some states that's historically been the idea. Um, other states have tied it to um, the way Social Security does it. Um, so Social Security, there's, I think it's in the 130000 range per year. Basically, you don't withhold um, contributions on income above a certain amount that adjusts every year. Um, that's a hotly debated policy topic too, whether that should be true. Right. Um but I think that some states have said like that sort of feels like a natural place to do it. It's a thing that like payroll systems are used to doing already. Um, but really what I would say writ large is it's a policy decision. It's one of the levers you have to control this. I think when we talk about premiums, we're always adjusting different pieces that make the rate shift out in different ways in the math. Um, and one of the tools you have is that if you either put that cap really high or don't put a cap, that's going to make the rate a little bit lower for everyone. Um, and I think you get to decide how to do that. Um, I will say DC does not have a cap. Um, there's a lot going on in the way DC sets up their program generally, but I think it's, it's not, um, a, a rule in a technical sense that you have to have a cap. I think it's a policy decision about how you want to strike that balance and whether you'd prefer to have everyone pay in teeny bit less or, or how you want to strike that balance. Thanks. Sarah, and just be mindful, I know you have to leave, so I just want to make sure we get to you. No, thank you very much. I apologize, folks, that I do need to leave in a couple minutes, but I'm so glad I get to ask a question before I go. Um, so from looking at this from an equity perspective, which I think is really important, um, when we're talking about um, wage replacement rates that are addressed, uh, that are intended to be progressive, and you know, make sure that um, either based on the, the actual rates or the cap, you know, that functionally um, ends up in a, uh, in a higher wage replacement rate for a lower wage worker. Um, I'm wondering if there's any data on a potential unintended consequence of that for dual income families where the lower wage worker ends up always being the person who takes more bonding leave or always ends up being the, the person who takes time away from their career to care for somebody who um, is ill. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if there's data around that and if there's been a, if there are best practices in terms of mitigation of that potential unintended consequence. Does that make sense? Um, so I'm not aware of any specific data um, on that topic, I mean, I think there's, um, in the broader world, I know there's been, been research on, um, particularly in um, male-female couples, that there's gendered ways that are tied to income distribution, which I suspect is part of where you're thinking is coming from of exactly how um, families make those kind of caregiving um, allocations. Um, we have seen data that suggests, um, I think again, thinking from a, a gender equity perspective, that um, higher wage replacement rates correspond with higher male leave taking. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a lot to unpack in why that's true, but I think it, it is what the, the data seems to show us and that's something to think about. Um, I think we don't have, a, I'm not aware of any specific data exactly on this, so I'm not sure exactly how to, to work at that um, mitigation piece, but I, I think the way we tend to think about all these pieces is we want a benefit that really works for all workers. Um, so we're particularly focused on low income workers. We wanna make sure we have a benefit that's affordable and sustainable for them, but we also want this to be a high quality benefit for middle and higher income workers for the gender equity reasons today, because we know that there's, there are lots of folks who are in middle and higher income households who have these kinds of needs. Um, so I think the, the way we tend to think about it is how do we create, how do we strike the right balance of generosity and affordability while also providing a benefit that's gonna really work for everyone. And I think that is really the, the goal. Like this is not, um, this is a program that has important poverty reduction <laughs> impacts, but it is not intended to be a program that's just for low income workers or just for folks. Um, we have another, it's supposed to be a universal program and to do that right, we need to figure out how to set it up in a way that's going to meet the needs of all workers and all employers. 
Yeah, I will just plus one to everything Molly just said. I'm also not aware of any studies that um, look at this, although it's certainly interesting. Um, I, you know, one thing to consider also is that um, paid family and medical leave is hugely important. We think it ties together so many different things, but at the end of the day, um, unfortunately, it is not the only thing that workers need. Um, and so, yes, if, if you can think of a way or if we can help you think of a way to make this work even better for dual earners, absolutely. Um, but, you know, there may be other things that will also help get to that need. And just to, to go sort of in a different direction, but I think off some of the same questions, um, what the data have shown us is that um, paid leave is really valuable for women's labor force attachment. Um, so particularly in relation to childbirth, women who are able to take paid leave following childbirth are more likely to return to work. They're going to earn higher um, over the course of their lifetime. It's an investment in making sure that those women can return to work and return to earning in the way that they want to. And there, there's less direct, but I think there's lots of good reason to believe there's similar effects on other kinds of caregiving, since we know that for exactly the reasons you've outlined, women disproportionately bear the burden of other kinds of caregiving. Um, so I think in terms of we're not going to solve underlying pay equity problems this way, though we'll keep working on it. Um, but I think we're, we're chipping away. I think giving paid leave is chipping away at some of those because it's making it more possible to say, I'm going to take the short amount of time I need now and then return to work, ready to come back, ready to fully focus on it without taking that sort of lifetime income hit, as opposed to the alternative, which is a whole lot of people, mostly women, not having the options and even having to leave the labor force altogether. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sam. Do you have other questions? Not saying anything. I actually have a few. Um, I was wondering, um, so of the four states you mentioned that have the small business exemption, you mentioned they have different sizes. Have there been any impacts on the program? Have those states seen like a higher uptake of people using the program or have they seen issues where that has negative impacts on the program? Just wondering if there's any data on that. Um, so the short answer is, um, when we talk about 10, we're including the three programs that are not fully implemented yet, which is where um, half of the small business exemptions are. And um, so really the only states where we've seen that be implemented and had a chance to play out are um, Washington State and Massachusetts. Um, I'm not aware of any data that suggests that particular piece has had a particular impact on usage. And I'd be a little surprised um, if it did, because honestly, I suspect most workers don't know <laughs> whether or not their employer um, is paying into the program or not. Um, and it might actually be confusing. Um, to know that, I think what we have seen in both of those states, um, particularly in Washington State, where we have a, a slightly longer track record, so their program launched uh, in January of 2020, Massachusetts launched January of this year. Um, so in Washington State, I think the one thing we have seen, which is, I think, a helpful data point, um, is their rate has stayed quite low. So one of the concerns you might have is, just in general, the fewer people who are paying in, it makes rates slightly higher for everybody. And the question is, how much slightly to strike that right balance again? Um, but I think in Washington State, what we've seen is that the rates have still stayed at an affordable, sustainable rate for everybody. So that still seems like the right balance. Um, but I think, unfortunately, we just don't have a super ton of track record there. I mean, we do sort of have the track record of um, Rhode Island and California, which exempt all employers <laughs> from contributions, um, which is not the balance we would recommend striking. Um, but I, I think um, what we've really seen, at least to the extent that we have data from those states, is that um, there's options. There's options for states in terms of what's that, again, that balance that you want to strike between a program that's affordable for everybody and exactly how you want to slice and dice that to, to make the choices that are right for your state. Thank you. And uh, another quick question. I'm just wondering, you know, we have seen that paid family medical leave can save lives, especially over the last now longer than 18 months. I keep doing the same thing. For some reason, 18 is what's stuck in my head. And here comes the spooky toy. Um, I'm just wondering if there's been any uh, data on sort of cost savings to states with these programs, because we know, you know, when, you know, employers and employees have access to these programs, it prevents them from potentially going on much more expensive programs that come back to the state. You know, I come from the world of education and we always think about what the advantages of early childhood education have to the state. You know, I think it was something like a study. I think 10 years ago in Maine showed that for every dollar the state spends on early childhood education, we get $14 back in savings. So I'm just wondering if there's any sort of national data we can kind of keep in the back of our minds on the cost savings to the state by having something like this. So I think we have um, a lot of pieces of evidence where we can kind of connect the dots. 
Um, so one piece, for example, is that um, when um, people who are seriously ill have family caregivers able to care for them, it means they're they're less likely to end up in nursing homes and maybe less likely to need um, care paid for um, by Medicaid or Medicare. Like th- those kinds of impacts in terms of people are healthier when they have family caregivers, and that translates into cost savings to state programs. Um, second, we know that uh, when people have access to paid leave, they're less likely to use public benefits. Mm-hmm. Um, generally, and that's going to turn into some cost savings. Um, third, we have slightly less direct data than I'd like for us to have, but I think we have lots of good reason to believe that when people can take the leave they need for their own health, they're going to be healthier. Mm-hmm. Um, and given that we know that nationwide, something like one in three Americans are covered by some kind of government health care when you add up all the programs, um, and healthier people cost less in health care. Um, so, you know, when people aren't putting off that surgery that they need, when they're getting that mammogram, so they find out earlier, like all of those pieces, I think we have lots of good sort of common sense reasons um, to believe that even if we don't sort of have the formal study to back it up. And then sort of big picture, I think thinking from a state perspective, um, more people having paid leave means more people who can stay in the workforce, keep earning and keep paying taxes, um, particularly women, but not just women. Um, and so I think that that's where some of this, I think we really see paid leave as an investment um, and that's why I think, in, for example, um, the Center for American Progress has updated a couple of times um, a national study on the cost of doing nothing, the ways in which writ large, um, the economy as a whole is really losing out on billions and billions of dollars a year um, because folks don't have the paid leave they need and so are having to, to leave the workforce or to scale back um, in other ways. So I think we have lots of good reasons to believe that you're going to be putting more money into the state's economy, you're going to be having more in tax revenues, you're going to be reducing impact. Um, on other state programs. And I think what that comes down to is in a lot of ways, sort of we collectively are paying for this already. We're just paying for it inefficiently in a way that isn't good for workers and families. And I think there's opportunities to really sharpen the way that we're tackling this to make sure that we're doing it efficiently and cost effectively in a way that's um, working for everybody. Thank you. Absolutely. And my one last question, which we sort of, I think this sort of ties into everything you just said. Um, but something that I've thought about a lot and in conversations with other employers and small businesses, um, you know, for a lot of us who can't afford to have a robust program that larger employers might not have, that we sort of see this opportunity to have this as a recruitment tool. So I'm wondering if you've seen or heard, you know, this might not necessarily be in your wheelhouse, but I guess one of those places I'd love to hear from, you know, employer, small employers in states where they have this, if they've been able to use it as a recruitment tool or just a way to sort of really equalize, you know, their benefit packages with larger employers. Yeah, I think absolutely it's seen as a recruitment tool. I know um, small employers that I've spoken to have really looked forward to this program as a way to be on par with some of the benefits that can be offered by larger employers. Um, I'm not coming up at the moment with a study that says this directly, although Molly might have one at the tip of her tongue, but I think definitely this really helps small employers not lose their workforce to a larger employer when someone is planning uh, a future that might include some need for care. Yeah, I think we don't, I'm not aware of any studies that are specifically doing the small business recruiting tie. Um, We certainly have studies out of um, California, out of Rhode Island, that show when you've had the program in place for a little while and you survey even smaller employers, but over and over again, what small employers will tell you is either this was good for me or this was just no big deal. Um, Like the the data really don't show, you know, large numbers of small employers saying there was a negative impact. It's, it's, It's very consistently either this was good or this, you know, this was neutral. No, it wasn't a problem for me. And it was this benefit to other folks. Um, we certainly do have uh, lots of individual really strong champions uh, who are small business owners in small space. So I think about, um, uh, for example, um, Molly Moon Neitzel, who runs Molly Moon Ice Cream in Washington State um, and has now testified before Congress a couple of times, um, who is always, when I think about small businesses, like I hear her voice um, in my head because she can really speak really eloquently to how this has mattered for her small business, how it's meant being able to keep the folks that she wanted to keep to have those benefits. And I think her and and many other people like her in other states have had very much that experience of that leveling the playing field of being able to have this. And I I would say sort of, you know, more anecdotally, but I think it's really true that uh, I think small business owners, one of the things we know about them is they have smaller businesses. So they, they have a, you know, if you're running a 50,000 person company, you're not going to know everybody. Um, But if you're running, you know, a 20 person shop, it's not employee number, whatever, needs time for her mom's cancer, it's Beth. And you want to be able to do right by Beth. You care about your folks. You want to be able to keep them, but you need the resources and the tools to be able to do that. 
Um, and this is an opportunity, I think, to enable small business owners to do what I, I truly believe the vast, vast majority of small businesses want to do already because they care about their folks and they want to take care of them and they just need the tools and resources to be able to do it in a sustainable way. Absolutely. I'm sorry, if I could also just, um, everything that both Marianne and Molly said is 100% correct. And I also just wanted to add that um, just this morning, for example, I was skimming a paper that showed that um, support for paid leave has increased among small employers uh, since the COVID pandemic. So it's always been strong support, but it's, it's just increased over time. So I think that speaks well to um, the benefits that small employers are seeing. Definitely. Thank you. And I think that's one of the conversations I've been having, at least in my own business circle, and I know is not unique, um, is that especially when we look at the sort of, uh, you know, the, the great resignation or the great movement of labor right now, and with a lot of, you know, flux in the workforce, you know, with everyone really competing for a very small pool of employees, something like this is, you know, really gives small employers an advantage to be able to really compete in a very uh, hard hiring market. So it's something that I feel like has become increasingly clear and dire for small businesses over the past few months and years. So thank you. Any other questions? Going once, going twice. Well, I wanna thank the three of you. These were incredibly informative presentations and um, we'll definitely be in touch if um, the commission has any questions moving forward. I wanna thank you for taking the time out of your busy days and for sharing all of your expertise with us um, and really helping us sort of set the stage on what's out there on a national level. So thank you. I don't know, thank Representative, you. if you'd like to, if my coach would like to add anything before we move on to the next item. I would just echo uh, everything you just said. This was really, really informative and helpful. Uh, and the just the discussion sort of raised questions for me that I hadn't thought of before. Um, so I really appreciate that. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And uh, moving next onto our agenda, I'm gonna say, um, and then I should add, we do have contact information if it's fine with the three panelists that we can share with the commission members so that we can, you know, if anyone has any other questions, we can follow up as well. And um, let me just pull up our agenda. Up next, we do want to move to sort of the next homework assignment, I guess, is a way to put it, but sort of the nitty gritty of uh, framework for our next steps for looking at a paid family medical leave program in Maine. Um, some of the required elements, which uh, were discussed in um, our two presentations, but I think I'm going to pass it over to our Opal analysts who have helped create sort of building off of that better balance framework, our own sort of link framework for all of us to start sort of drilling down um, and sort of thinking about all the different requirements and por portions we'd like to see in this. So I'll pass it over to Anna. Hi. Okay. So we have, um, I'm going to share my screen if I can possibly manage it. Actually, Anna, if I can interrupt you real quick, I have Please a do. <laughs> for a short break. Does anyone else need like a three to four minute stretch break? I think I could definitely grab a glass of water. Okay, I'm seeing nodding heads. So let's do um, a five minute break for the legislators. I'll say actually five minutes. I'll set a timer, not legislative five minutes. Um, and just a reminder when we go on this break that we are being recorded live. So please put your um, computer on mute, turn off your video and you'll hear me um, You know, when the five minutes are up, come back on. Um, everyone grab a glass of water, bathroom break, stretch, run around your house, go from there and we'll be back in five minutes.
According to the timer on my wristwatch, we just hit five minutes. <laughs> so give everyone a chance to get settled. And thank you, Drew Christopher. That was a good reminder to stretch our legs and grab some water. Thank you all. It can't happen. The problem with Zoom meetings sometimes you just sort of get tunnel vision, realize you've been sitting for quite some time. Okay, just wait for Representative Stearns to rejoin us and for Emily as well. Oh, got Representative Stearns and I think we're good to go. So now transitioning back, um, turn it over to Anna, our Opal analyst to go over the framework we were discussing. Okay, um, see if I can successfully share my screen here. I can pull it up in the right place. Oh, I had to bring it over perhaps. You can see it. Oh, you can? Okay, I'm looking at it on a different screen. So that's really confusing to me. Um, I would like to bring it over so I could see it all in one. Well, never mind. Okay, I may not end up looking at you because I'm looking at another screen. So um, we have actually, uh, we sent you this so you could see it ahead of time and it will look sort of familiar in terms of the questions that are, are on it. But I do just want to let you know that we'll send you a newer version that has a, that is fillable. Our secretary figured out how to do that well, because I, I don't know how to do that, um, it figured out how to make it a fillable form for you. So it's going to look really familiar. Um, you know, you'll put your name at the top, and, but you'll see these questions that are based on the, um, the chart from a better balance that you have seen a number of times and is posted on the website as well. So you can see the questions of that you heard about in the presentations as well, about what purposes the leave can be used for, who is covered. I hope this is scrolling down as I go here because I can't actually see what's going on. Um, where the public, you can, oh good. Where the public sector workers are automatically covered. Domestic workers, can self-employed workers opt into the coverage, the requirements to qualify for benefits, um, the family members that are covered, how the program is funded, the percentage of wages um, that workers receive, the maximum weekly benefit, um, how long you can receive a benefit for uh, an unpaid waiting period and whether workers are entitled to have their job back when they um, return, how the insurance is provided um, and, and anything else you might have thought of that wasn't put, put on those charts. So I'm going to see if I can figure out how to stop sharing it now, except I don't know where the command is. I can't see it anymore. Um, hmm. Uh, sorry. Um, so while I'm figuring, oh, somebody help me there. Thank you, whoever did that. Um, so um, that, that chart will be um, available for you to fill out. We'll send you a new one. Um, I think it uh, is sort of a little bit determinant on um, the chairs in terms of when you'd like that back. Um, so I don't mean to throw that right at you. I don't know whether you want that in, uh, in time for the next meeting, which we will determine later on and let you know what that is, um, or whether you want that just as an ongoing project. I don't know if you have an opinion about that yet. I think um, definitely something um, my co-chair and I need to discuss, but I'd say sort of ongoing homework. Um, I know there's definitely a little bit more information that uh, I've heard from commission members that we'd like to have available, some main base data, but uh, Representative Cloutier? Yeah, um, I think that, uh, the chairs are going to get together, I think, with Anna and Colleen, and we can decide uh, when we want them back, um, and then maybe get that information out to folks with notification of the date for the, and time for the next meeting. Um, and then also, if we could just share the better balance state by state um, uh, comparison uh, at the same time that we share this fillable form, I think that would be helpful for folks. I think we might've already shared it, but if we could just resend it, that would be great. Definitely. And, and just to say, it, there won't be a pop quiz. Everyone will make sure it's clear when we're going to be coming back. But I've been personally, you know, keeping sort of a version of that in my um, notes and files on this. And I found it personally helpful, especially, you know, with the presentation today, there's a bunch of things, you know, as Representative Cloutier was saying that, you know, I hadn't really thought about, you know, especially on the claims management portion and all of that. So I hope you all find this as helpful a tool as I know I have. Um, oh, love the puppy view of Bulldog. So sweet. Um, 
that being said, um, please let us know if there's anything, you know, like Anna was saying, we do have the anything else column, but if there's something you feel like um, came up that's missing, please let us know so that we can incorporate it into the framework as well. Any questions on that? Representative Stearns? Uh, thank you, Maddie. Just to make sure I have the assignment clear, um, you're looking for, it's, it's nearly a brainstorming exercise, am, am I right? Uh, comments, questions, anything that uh, relates to the, the question in the box? Exactly. You know, if there's something that you see one area that you don't have a strong opinion on, but you'd like more information, that would be absolutely great. You know, could we find out X, Y, and Z or, you know, still unsure. But if there's something that, you know, I want to see X, Y, and Z, you can put in, you know, I would like to see X amount of weeks or any portion like that. So it really is that brainstorming exercise and sort of matrix to help guide us. Very good. Thank you. Could I ask a question? Absolutely. Maggie, where, is there any way we can get some tangible numbers? I just, I work better when I can actually see figures. So I'm wondering about sizes of states versus mm -hmm. a payment that, I mean, when they talk about a, um, a payout, what are they talking about for low wage versus a middle income? What, does this, can the state give us some exact, exact examples of what their states are doing? That's definitely something we can ask for for more data, sort of dig into that much more sort of weedy level. And I think it would be helpful potentially if we could get maybe an example, we heard, you know, the progressive scale, we heard the cap and all of the sort of different wage replacements to see what they look like. And obviously on the state level, for Maine, we can't necessarily grab that, but we would, um, you know, we can get more demographics to sort of look at the average, you know, wages. And I think Commissioner Fortman, I think you're the one who mentioned maybe the state economist as well. We can get that sort of, you know, what that looks like for the average, you know, workforce in Maine. Uh, Wendy and then Representative Cloutier. Actually, I, that was exactly where I was heading. So if we could get the average weekly wage um, information, both for Maine and for any other states, because uh, to Benita's um, point, you know, a lot of these, cal these uh, states have calculations that you have to do and we're a little blind without the AWWs. So that would be helpful. Definitely. Thank you. Representative Cloutier. Yeah, I was just gonna say, um, I I agree that we we need the numbers, um, but I also, one of the things that I found um, really, I think remarkable about this group the last time we met was that we weren't starting from a deficit perspective. Um, and so it's, while the numbers are super, super important and we wanna know what we're getting into, I wanna make sure that we're of the mindset that we wanna create the best program we can for the workers and the uh, employers in this state and that we're not, um, you know, just kind of going into this with this with the the expectation that it's going to be so expensive that we're not able to do it. Excellent reminder. It reminds me uh, to go back to the education world again. We always talk about down and to the right when we're looking at the funding formula of everyone goes down, finds their town, and goes to the right. So I think that's an excellent reminder of yes, please use the numbers and let's definitely get the numbers to sort of shape our sort of lens of looking at what the groundwork is for this, but also remember we need to have a little bit of the sort of dream work at the same time to figure out how we're going to narrow it down. Uh, Wendy? Yeah. I would just say in, in response to that, I was thinking more about the numbers in terms of thinking about the adequacy of benefits that each uh, person receives versus the total cost, but I, I totally appreciate and agree with your comment. Agreed. And, and that's actually one of the things I was wondering about as well, um, especially, you know, on the regional cost adjustments, what it costs to live in the different areas of our state. And also, I can't remember who made the point about, you know, the age and our demographics and what that cost of care is to the system versus, you know, leave for, you know, the adoption of a child, birth of a child, et cetera, et cetera. So I definitely think those numbers will be very useful. Any um, other questions on the framework or any other requests for data that just jump right to the top of your head? Okay, I'm gonna take the silence as a good sign. <laughs> um, next, we're gonna sort of move into speaking of numbers, 
a little bit about, um, I'll toss it over to Colleen and Anna, sort of about the timeline and requirements for the actuarial study. And just a reminder for folks, you know, when we're looking at that framework and having all these questions. One of the things that's really nice about this commission is we're not going to be flying blind after we have this, you know, robust conversation that we can send these different options out for this actuarial study and really get that concrete data, which is something that's not always happening with a lot of, you know, policy commissions. So just to remind folks that I feel a lot better knowing that we have this opportunity. So uh, with that, I pass it over to Colleen. Sure. Um, just to follow up on what Senator Daughtry said, um, I think, as you know, um, one of the, and I'm going to pull up the um, resolve really quickly for everybody to take a look at. Um, one of the, um, the commission has a number of duties, but one of um, the primary duties for the commission to, to fulfill is to what's highlighted here to contract for and complete an actuarial study of the planned program under subsection three. And subsection three is really what we've just been talking about, which is developing a plan to implement a paid family medical leave program uh, for Maine and sort of to develop that framework and design that scope of work for the actuarial study to be done. Um, so I think what the framework is intended to do is to help you um, and the homework is for the task force or the commission to sort of do that work and develop um, the elements of the program upon which an actuarial study can be done. And then there are some existing things that um, building upon that, that the actuarial study is intended to look at, which are things like the startup costs and the ongoing costs of the program um, the, and the economic impact on and benefits to the state, as well as sort of the level of contributions that would be needed to maintain solvency of the program moving forward. Um, and so that is going to be an important task, I think, for the uh, commission to focus its work on and over its next few meetings um, to sort of design that scope of work for the actuarial study. Um, and we talked last time at your meeting, at your first meeting about sort of the, um, the timeline and the challenges associated with the timeline because your reporting date is February 1 of 2022, which doesn't really leave you a lot of time as things are structured now to design that scope of work and to have that actuarial study be contracted for and completed. So some of the things you need to think about in terms of meeting that timeline is whether or not you may need to ask for some additional time uh, for that actuarial study to be completed. Um, so that's something to think about. But in terms of the um, nitty gritty of sort of the contracting requirements for the commission, as you move forward and you think about sort of designing that scope of work, um, Anna and I wanted to let you know that we talk, touched on this last time, but we have spoken with the executive director of the legislative uh, council about um, doing that work. The legislature is not subject to the same type of requirements for contracting that executive branch agencies are, um, but that's certainly something uh, that the commission can determine as to how you want the process to work. Um, some commissions, when they've been tasked with contracting out with um, uh, outside entities on certain subjects, like whether it's an actuarial study or whether it's another type of study, um, they can identify one particular entity to complete that work. Um, and that can move a little bit quicker and be a little more smooth in terms of completing that work and, and meeting uh, a timeline. Um, if the commission believes that there is an opportunity to invite proposals from a number of entities, then you'll need to build that time into your, um, into your uh, thinking as to how you're gonna complete your work. So you'll need to build in some time for uh, inviting proposals from other entities and developing a process for the commission or a subset of the commission, either the chairs or a subcommittee, to evaluate those proposals um, 
and make decisions on who you'd want to contract with um, and, and what that process will look like. So I think the most important thing, um, the takeaway from our discussions from the executive director's office, and I think from the commission's perspective, is to really focus on um, designing that scope of work that you would want the actuarial study to look at. And I think that really depends on thinking more carefully about what elements of a program you would want um, for Maine and what things you would want the actuarial uh, analysis to look at, whether it's one particular program, which I think that the way that the um, resolve is drafted now, it's really developing a program for Maine, but you may also have some opportunities to ask an actuarial study to look at different options, you know, look at different timelines, perhaps different eligibility requirements, different contribution rates, you know, things like that. And so those would be important questions for you to think about if you wanted the actuarial study to look at various elements of an overall program. So those are, I think, um, what we wanted to convey to you today is really to start thinking about that. And really that needs to be task one. And if that can be completed by in your next few meetings, that might be the most useful way to focus your, your time and your attention and then develop a process for um, the contracting and the actuarial study to be done later. And then you folks be, will be able to come back and complete your work because the idea of, um, even if you knew that you had a, an entity um, that you knew was going to be able to complete an actuarial study for you, if you had identified that person today, the idea of having that completed by February is really probably not uh, a timeline that could be met. Um, so focusing your attention on really designing that scope of work and figuring out what you want the actual aerial study to look like um, you could, in laying that groundwork now might be the most effective use of your time between now and February and sort of the back end of it, the nuts and bolts of doing the contracting and all those sorts of functions, Anna and I and the executive director's office of the legislative council would be available to help you um, help you complete that. Thank you, Colleen. Just a quick question. If we were to have a subcommittee to look at um, various vendors for the actuarial study, does that have to have approval from the meetings for, from the presiding officers or is that free from that because it's a subcommittee? Do you know? Um, it may need some further discussion with, uh, I think the executive director's office and or the legislative council to just let them know yeah. um, that that's going to happen. Um, I think there are, there may be funds within the budget to accomplish that, particularly when you're meeting remotely um, because that does have an impact on the cost. Um, that have been budgeted for study committee meetings. So I think that would be a further discussion that we would have to have. Um, mm -hmm. But there are, again, you know, there's lots of flexibility as to how you would want to do that, whether it's a small subcommittee. Um, some commissions have done it as a full commission, which I think makes it a little more challenging to sort of meeting to do the scoring. Um, executive branch agencies typically will name a panel you know, of a few folks that will have the responsibility for um, reviewing proposals and, and scoring them. And that's, that's a model that you could use as well. Um, but if you were going to have additional meetings, um, I think there might be a need to have further discussion, particularly if there's legislative involvement um, with the Legislative Council. Thank you. Another question. Yeah. It sounds like this is unrealistic as far as the um, timeline that we have right now. So I was just going to ask Colleen, what is a more realistic timeline that she's looking at? I think there's lots of flexibility and, and I think the, the chairs can um, uh, certainly chime in um, with what they're thinking, but um, the commission does have an opportunity in their report back date to make recommendations for um, additional legislation. And often 
commissions like this that might be faced with challenges to their timeline have asked for um, additional legislation to uh, continue their work um, into the future, you know, into the future. So that's something that I think uh, this commission would have an opportunity to discuss and determine. Thank you. Any other questions on that? One of the things that I'm coming back to thinking about is wondering just sort of to gauge the temperature of the commission members, whether when it comes to the actuarial study and sort of vetting and making some of these decisions, is this something that we'd want to do as a full commission? Or is it something that we think sort of a subcommittee might be a little bit more nimble to sort of look at a few um, different vendors and sort of come back to the greater group as a whole? Um, I don't have a uh, gut instinct and my co-chair and I haven't really had a chance to talk about this, but I, I, I'm seeing her sort of agreeing, you know, that neither of us necessarily have a really strong impact. So this is where I think we'd look to you, um, especially because we're trying to be mindful of time that perhaps maybe sort of a smaller subcommittee might be able to sort of do this at the same time that we're going through other work and be able to report back. So wondering if anyone has any um, strong opinions on that. This is where we need like the poll option on Zoom. Wendy? It does seem like it could save our, our larger meeting time for the group to make those important decisions and have that um, done more efficiently offline with a handful of people. I think that the more I think about it, I feel like that's definitely probably the best case scenario. So I'm thinking um, just to sort of jump in, perhaps if you are interested mm -hmm. And I don't know what like the reasonable size for a subcommittee. I guess I'd sort of defer to Colleen and Anna on, you know, the typical makeup of a subcommittee. I know what we do for like budget work in the education, but um, it's typically about like five members or less. Um, I think we've done three occasionally as well. Um, but if you would be interested in sort of looking through different vendors and going through that process, um, I would sort of ask you to um, let my co-chair and I know over the next couple of days, just shoot us an email um, so that we can sort of flag that or we can put together, you know, a poll to see gauge interest. The other thing that I put out there is, you know, we've identified a couple vendors, you know, who've worked with the state before or have done this type of work um, with other states sort of on a national perspective. But if there's someone you know um, who does work in this area or if anyone who's listening who's interested, we definitely love to sort of solicit some suggestions so that we have, you know, great <laughs> those of us who have served the education representative Stearns is very well aware of uh, the dulcet brains of Bailey the coon hound. Uh, but just sort of a, a call for folks who might have suggestions on that, we could definitely use that. As well. And I think maybe she'll stop. Fingers crossed. We're gonna mute for just a split second and pass the gavel over to the coach. Thanks, Maddie. Um, so, I guess any so any questions about sort of moving forward? Is anyone sort of opposed? I guess to doing the smaller subgroup. Okay, great. Um, so we've made a decision, excellent. <laughs> uh, let me pull up my agenda. I thought I had it up. Okay, I think Bailey's starting to calm down a little bit. I think the package <laughs> is delivered. <laughs> I was going to say, I think um, Colleen and Anna let us know if, if we're missing this, but I think next up is talking about future meetings. And so one of the things we've touched about on this a little bit about, you know, the request for, you know, the wage data and a little more on the concrete numbers, I'm wondering if there's any other requests for information that could be beneficial to commission members. I know one of the things um, we talked about is having the main economist come before us, and I guess Commissioner Portman had sort of look to you about any other sort of, you know, fact driven things that we'd be able to um, sort of pull in from DOL, but wondering any other things that come to the surface that people would like to hear, any resources you'd like to have? Okay. 
going once, going twice. Um, the other thing is we, oh, Wendy. I didn't get my hand on the button there, but um, will we be receiving the decks that were presented today? Yes. Okay. I yes, that. I do yeah. already have Mary, uh, the family values at work presentation, those slides, and I'll follow up with a uh, better balance to get copies of those and forward those to all of you. Great. Thank you. As well as they offered to provide some additional information um, and links and, and we'll follow up um, with you either later today or tomorrow. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so other thing that, you know, we're discussing planning for future meetings. And if you looked at the resolve above sort of the actuarial study, you'd see the portion about public comment. I just wanted to share a little bit what um, my co-chair and I have been discussing. One, with technology, we're trying to find the way to best navigate this and also find the way to best um, sort of solicit as much public input as possible and wanted to share and sort of gauge um, what the commission thinks of uh, a couple of ideas we've been throwing around is one, um, in recognition that not everyone can take the time to come and present before a uh, commission, we are trying to find a method to be able to sort of gauge different stories and impact in a different format. And we've discussed the idea of putting together a survey. This is something um, we've used in other commissions and been really um, had some amazing feedback come through it. And so it's sort of gauge what we discuss, discuss as a commission is sort of like four or five questions that we'd really like to gauge. Like some of the things that we were thinking about is how many weeks, um, how would you like this to be covered? Or, you know, what do you think should be covered? and be able to have a form where people can, you know, yes or no or multiple choice question answer it. But then the most important part at the end of, you know, please share your story. Are there any things you really like us to consider? Blah, 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 blah. Have a form to be able to have people be able to submit this at any time of day, you know, recognizing that we're discussing paid family medical leave and not everyone's schedules look the same. So we wanted to find a way for people to be able to have their voices heard, not within, you know, just a traditional commission, Zoom or format. Um, and then the other thing we were thinking about is trying to schedule a day where we specifically solicit input from the public. So for legislators, this would be very similar to sort of a public hearing. And for commission members, this would be where we're, you know, opening the Zoom doors to the public. We'd be soliciting input for people to share their stories um, with time limits. Um, in the legislature, we typically do three to five minutes time limit and asking people to really talk about, you know, what they'd like to see from the program, what they're excited about, what their concerns are to hear from, you know, employees, from businesses, also from, you know, industry folks who have run these programs before. You know, we've received a letter from Unum. I'm sure there's other groups as well who would like to share their experience, but really a chance to have like a really robust day where, we're, where we hear that um, and are able to sort of solicit that feedback. So would love to see if anyone has any suggestions, any strong feelings about that, any any ideas, or if I'm just seeing sort of nodding. Would like, we also solicit um, email testimony? Because like if, you know, kind of in between a survey and actually showing up on a specific day and time. Definitely, that's one of the things we've been trying to figure out and Colleen and Anna can mention as well about where the email, goes um, with the IT issues, but that was kind of what we we're thinking is finding a way to be able to solicit those emails. Um, and the other idea with the survey is also just so that we could get some statistical, you know, X amount of people who filled out the survey feel blank or X amount, you know, to be able to have that to guide our work. But ideally we would like to have all three forms of public input. And I'll just add that we do have on the commission's website um, an invitation for folks to submit written comments um, to us by email. Um, and I did receive uh, one email over the weekend um, that I will, uh, with someone who e emailed their comments um, that I will share with you um, uh, today. I just didn't have a chance to email it out before the meeting, but um, so we have started to get some of those short email comments, but as Senator Daughtry said, we also plan to put up a link to either a survey monkey survey or um, a Google survey, which we can also put up on the website and share by email with folks um, and invite their comments. And the advantage to that is sort of some of the data, um, you know, some of the basic data can be select, you know, can be included and accumulated for folks who do participate in that survey, which may be useful to you as opposed to trying to go through which Anna and I can certainly do and will do 
um, sort of collate um, responses that you might get um, just through email. So that's already available. And then hopefully we'll get a survey up soon um, once we settle on sort of the, the questions that we'd like to ask in addition to sort of um, an offer your comments generally kind of question. Thank you, Colleen. Representative Cloutier and then Drew Christopher afterwards. I think I saw your hand go up. So Representative Cloutier. Yeah, I just wanted to um, kind of give a little bit of a warning, I guess, to folks who maybe haven't served on um, one of these commissions before that uh, the way that the email testimony kind of comes in, uh, it'll go to Colleen and Anna, and then I think they will then email it out to the commission members. Um, and so some there's no way of knowing how much public comment we're going to get. Um, but sometimes it can feel a little bit overwhelming. So just know that those emails will be sort of coming in fast and furious um, and they'll just be in your inbox. Important reminder. <laughs> uh, Drew Christopher. Oh, I really like the idea of this survey. So um, I just wanted to name that. I think all sort of three ways are really important. Um, I just wonder about a question that kind of gets to this like wage replacement for low wage workers um, as maybe some kind of question about how much, how many, how much of your wages we need to be covered for this to work for you. Um, not sure the best way to word that, but I, I think that that piece could be really important in a, in a survey like this. Thank you. That's excellent. And, and that's a good reminder. I'd say, you know, if people have ideas that they'd like to get the public input on specific items like that. And even if we need to do some wordsmithing, please email that to us as well. And um, Colleen, Anna, um, if we can put that sort of in the email when we're sending things out to have people thinking about that. Um, Emily? Uh, one thing just kind of building on that that I think should be flagged as we're also thinking about developing more specifics is um, seasonal workers. I mean, since Maine has such a seasonal economy, how are we going to accommodate that? And it might be a good survey question somehow just to get in there as well. Absolutely. Sort of maybe a way to sort of solicit for someone filling it out. Are you a seasonal worker? Are you full-time? Do you, are you dual income? That would be um, really beneficial to have as well. Any other questions? So Maddie, that also kind of raises the question for me about um, demographics for folks who are filling out the survey. Yeah. Um, I think that's could be really helpful in terms of looking at this issue of equity. Yeah. I agree. I know it'll make it a little bit longer, but I think having those demographics would be very, very beneficial on a multitude of you know wage level, employment, outlook, as well as just um, basic information as well. And then I will say, you know, as we're talking about this, the other portion that'll be up to all of us is once we're able to come up with these questions, I, you know, just to warn everyone, I will keep uh, pushing everyone to be able to share this within your own personal networks, within your own business, you know, just to make sure that we get a really robust uh, group. Obviously we'll do we everything we can to raise our voices, to raise this up, but, um, this really is a main based process. And I want to say this over and over again, I'll be like a broken record with it, but you know, this is a chance for us to build our own program that works for Maine. And so finding that way to really make sure people feel empowered to share their stories and share their voices and share their experience um, is going to be really um, important and incumbent on all of us. So. Okay, seeing sort of nodding heads and a little bit of what I like to call the Zoom fatigue stare, uh, which all of us Zoom legislators have become very familiar with. I just wanna uh, sort of recap. We've heard requests sort of the main level. So I think maybe Commissioner Fortman um, in the interim as we're planning for our next meeting, maybe we can be in touch to sort of talk about coordinating to be able to get some of that main uh, data for the next meeting, as well as some of the wage information that we've heard about. Um, We've talked about sort of setting the stage for the initial survey questions. So having people come back with that um, and thinking about that in the interim. Uh, just again, anything else that we can sort of, as uh, my co-chair and I and our analysts are setting the agenda, anything else you'd like to bring to the front for us to be able to look for? Going once, 
going to work. <laughs> well, it makes our work easier. Um, we'll definitely use that to go forward. Um, and just to let folks, we have the doodle poll we'll get back to, you. we know which dates work best for folks. And um, hopefully by the end of the week, if not sooner, we'll get back to you with the next meeting date as well. And also, as always, I've said it a bazillion times, but please, if you think of anything in the interim that you'd like to have or could be uh, useful, please let us know. Just shoot us an email or um, I think you have both of our cell phone numbers, so please give us a call. Benita, did you have a question? Okay. That being said, oh, Representative Stearns? Yeah, um, regarding the uh, email notifications, I'm wondering if FMLA uh, could send those out to, uh, uh, well, I, I've got the wrong acronym there, but the uh, Labor Committee, if they could send that out to uh, Colleen and she could forward it, it would save me digging around through the spam barrel to try to uh, find a notification. We can do that. Um, Zoom generates those automatically. So that's why it was coming from the Labor and Housing Committee, but I can definitely uh, we can definitely figure out a way to do that so that I can send out the links as well. It, it may be that folks show up as Anna or me when they come into the meeting, but that happened today and we can just change folks' names. So that might, we're happy to do that, Representative Stearns. I know folks have a hard time finding the links sometimes, um, but you may end up getting duplicate ones and you just use the one that works best, I guess. So I don't <laughs> think I can turn off the Zoom, the ones that Zoom sends automatically, but um, we can definitely also send it. Um, send additional ones as well. Definitely, and having it sent right before we hop on is always useful. Like today when I was running around like a chicken with my head cut off, it was super great to have it right there and be able to click it. So I just wanted to say thank you for that. Well, any other questions before I reach for the gavel? I just have a quick one. Um, did I hear correctly that the program design PDF would be resent in a fillable form or? Okay, thank you. And if you have any problems with any of the PDFs or if anything's not coming through, just let us know. Okay, last chance for questions. Uh, in the nice world of actually getting done early, which doesn't always go hand in hand with legislative work, um, we do have half an hour. We will be adjourning half an hour early. So I wanna thank all of you for spending your Monday morning with all of us and for sharing your questions. And once again, a thank you to our panelists. Um, Representative Cloutier, I don't know if you wanna add anything before we adjourn. Nope, just thanks to uh, Anna and Colleen for keeping us on track as always. And to all of you for being here. Agreed, thank you so much. And with that, uh, I will adjourn the meeting of the commission and have an amazing Monday, everyone. And we'll see you all soon. Take care. Everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Bye. you. Thanks.